Welcome to chapter four. This chapter is going to focus on probability distributions. There will be more notation and formulas, so make sure you're keeping track of those. In particular, watch for how things we've already covered are related to the new material that we're learning. It will help you to have an overall feel for the big picture of statistics. Okay, let's get to it. Hello, and welcome to the lecture video for chapter four, section one, probability distributions. In this section, we're going to learn how to distinguish between discrete random variables and continuous random variables, learn how to construct a discrete probability distribution and the graph of it, and know how to determine if a distribution you're evaluating is a probability distribution. We'll discuss a familiar set of values, this time related to a discrete probability distribution, finding the mean, variance, and standard deviation and how to find what's called the expected value of a discrete probability distribution. Let's begin. The result of a probability experiment is called an outcome. The proper term to represent a numerical value associated with each outcome of probability distribution is called a random variable. It is denoted by the lowercase x. There are two types of random variables, discrete, meaning individual, an example meaning number of sales calls a salesperson makes in one day, and continuous, meaning over an interval, an example being hours spent on sales calls in one day. Let's dig into those a little more. A discrete random variable has a finite or countable number of possible outcomes that can be listed. If we were to represent it on a number line, it would be individual circles filled in because those values are included but none of the surrounding non-integer values are included. In this example, a number of sales calls a salesperson makes in one day, that outcome can be counted. There are exactly four calls, or six calls, or if there are none, x equals zero. Anything that can be listed, counted, or tallied individually would be a discrete random variable. A continuous random variable is the opposite. It's an uncountable number of possible outcomes represented by an interval on the number line. The example of hours spent on sales calls in a day means that it could be a fraction of an hour or even a minute. These values can be measured to an infinitely small degree because they are continuous. We won't be dealing with two infinitesimal values, but I just want you to understand that these are infinite values between the integers. Of course, there's one half, one quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth, but there's also 0.16666 and 0.777. All of those are continuous random variables. They would belong in an interval. Things that are measured typically belong in this category. Things like time and weight, and you could be on a call for exactly 15 minutes or 0.25 hours or exactly one hour, but it would still be a continuous random variable because of how it's measured. Okay, let's do a few examples to see if you can tell the difference between a discrete and continuous random variable. Determine whether each random variable, x, is a discrete or continuous random variable. Number one, let x represent the number of Fortune 500 companies that lost money in the previous year. Pause the video and see if you can determine which x would be, discrete or continuous. Well, the number of companies that lost money can be counted, so that is a discrete random variable. We can't say that 2.75 companies lost money. The variable must be described in whole numbers. Okay, let's try another. Number two, let X represent the volume of gasoline in a 21 gallon tank. Pause the video and determine which X is, discrete or continuous. Because the amount of gasoline in the tank can be any volume between 0 gallons and 21 gallons, this is a continuous random variable. There could be 13.5 gallons, or half a gallon, or 6.2 gallons. Because our answer could be anything in between, this variable is continuous. Okay, now let's think about how we might graph the distribution of probabilities for these two types of random variables by the number lines that we just talked about. We basically establish that the values of the random variable compose the horizontal axis, and the vertical axis might be the probability of each outcome. So what would the graph of a discrete probability distribution look like compared to a continuous probability distribution? Well, we need to remember that the discrete random values are taking on integer values. 
the discrete random variable could be easily modeled with a bar graph because each value of x is noted on the horizontal axis and then the height of that bar is the probability of that outcome happening. Then the continuous distribution could be modeled with a line graph or a curve because all the points could be identified then joined with a line because there are infinitely many values between two close points on the number line. So the continuous random variable has to be modeled with a continuous curve. We're going to be focusing more on the discrete random variable and its distribution in this chapter and chapter 5 will focus more on the continuous random variable and its distribution. So let's talk more about discrete probability distributions. A discrete probability distribution lists each possible value the random variable can assume together with its probability. There are a few conditions that it must meet to be a discrete probability distribution. Number one, the probability of each value of the discrete random variable is between 0 and 1 inclusive. We've seen this before. That's part of our restrictions on probability and general probability. That is clearly between the values of 0 and 1 inclusively. Number 2. The sum of all the probabilities in the distribution has to be 1. This just makes sense because if we're representing all the possible probabilities, they're all going to be a fraction or portion of the whole and they must add up to 1. So let's talk about constructing a discrete probability distribution. Remember how a frequency distribution was a table? Well, same thing here. We're creating a table with different pieces of the puzzle, all related to the discrete probability. So first we say we let x be a discrete random variable with possible outcomes x sub 1, x sub 2, and so on. That's how we're identifying them, x. We start by creating a frequency distribution for all the possible values that x can take on. Then we want to find the relative frequency or probability of each value of x. So we would sum up the frequencies and divide each class by the sum of the frequencies. So we would find probability for each outcome. Then our last step is doing those two checkpoints for the conditions. Making sure each probability exists somewhere between 0 and 1 and making sure the sum of the probabilities or relative frequencies is 1. So let's go through an example together. An industrial psychologist administered a personality inventory test for passive aggressive traits to 150 employees. Each individual was given a whole number score from 1 to 5, where 1 is extremely passive and 5 is extremely aggressive. A score of 3 indicated neither trait. The results are shown. Construct a probability distribution for the random variable x, then graph the distribution using a histogram. So the data came out as follows. 21 people scored a 5, 30 people scored a 4, 42 scored a 3, 33 score to 2, and 24 score to 1. Now a quick point, this random variable is discrete because you can't take a fractional value when the numbers you've given for scores are integers, 1, 2, 3, and so on. You can't score a 1.5 if the scores they've given you to choose from are 1, 2, 3, and so on. So it is a discrete variable. If I were to make my frequency distribution, I would list the frequency of each score to the value of x as shown in the table. That's my frequency distribution. Now my next step is to find the probability or relative frequency for each of these scores. So what was the probability that someone scored a 1? What was the probability that someone scored a 2? Well, to find the relative frequency or probability, we divide the frequency of each class, or x, by the total of the frequencies. We were told the sample size on the previous slide. There were 150 employees. So we'll need to divide each of those numbers by 150. Pause the video and do those calculations for each of the numbers. They are listed on your lecture notes in the instructions. Okay, did you divide each number by 150 and come up with a decimal value? Great. Make sure you're putting that in the table on your notes, final decimal value. That's the probability. Here's what you should have gotten for the different values. 24 divided by 150 equals 0 0.16. 33 divided by 150 equals 0 0.22, and so on. If you got any of those wrong, make sure you're inputting the correct number from the information given. Okay, here's what you should have in your table. These are your probabilities, and the whole table is your discrete probability distribution. Now I need to do the last part, checking for those two conditions. First, we check that all of our probabilities here were within the range 0 to 1 inclusive. Is 0 0.16 between 0 and 1? Yes. And as we check through, all the rest of these are too. So we have met that condition. 
Next, we need to make sure that they all add up to 1. Otherwise, we're missing information, right? Because they all have to equal 1. So we add all the decimals, and yes, they do equal 1. So this is our discrete probability distribution. But my problem's not quite done, as I'm supposed to create a histogram of these passive-aggressive traits. So as we've talked about previously, we need to have the x-axis be our discrete random variable, and the y-axis be the probability for each value of x. So, so the height of each of these bars is the probability that it occurs. So the probability that you scored a 3 is 0 0.28, and so on. Something to note that relates to other mathematics and what we'll be dealing with in the next chapter is that each bar actually has an area that corresponds to its probability. Because if you treat each like a rectangle, each has one unit wide and the probability value high. So its area is length times width, or 1 times the probability. So when you're creating these distributions, you're not just creating a picture, you're representing the data in another mathematical way, as area. In the next chapter, we'll be working with the area under a curve rather than the area of rectangle, since those variables will be continuous. Neat, huh? Okay, let's see if we can determine whether a few distributions or tables we're presented with are discrete probability distributions or something else. Remember, there are conditions that must be met in order for them to be discrete probability distributions. The probabilities must all lie between 0 and 1 inclusively, and the probabilities must add up to 1. So we're essentially checking for these conditions. Here's the first one. Determine whether this distribution is a probability distribution. Pause the video and do the calculations needed to decide this. Okay, so we can just look at the probabilities listed and see that they all lie within 0 to 1 inclusively. But do they add up to 1? Well, a quick calculation on the calculator says no, they do not. They add up to 1.07. So this is not a probability distribution. Okay, let's try another. Determine whether this distribution is a probability distribution. Pause the video to decide this. Okay, this time the sum of the probabilities is 1, but there is a negative as one of the entries that is supposed to be a probability. Probability must be between 0 and 1 inclusively, and negative 1 does not fit into that range. So this is not a probability distribution. Okay, now we're going to talk about some subjects we've discussed before, but as they are related to a discrete probability distribution. Remember in the past they were frequency distributions, now we're doing discrete probability distributions. We're going to find the mean, variance, and standard deviation of a discrete probability distribution. First, the mean. The mean of a probability distribution that is discrete is found by summing the products of x times their probability. So we say mu is the sum of x times p of x. Each value of x is multiplied by its corresponding probability, and then all of those products are added together. I think it's important here to show a comparison of the formula you've already learned for frequency distribution. If you remember, it was mu equals the sum of the midpoints times their frequencies divided by our sample size. Well, this new formula is actually kind of hidden in the old formula. It looks like a completely new formula, the sum of x times p of x. Well, the probability of any of those values is the relative frequency, or the frequency of that outcome divided by the sum of the frequencies. From here, can't we say that f over n is equal to p of x? So the mean of a frequency distribution is modeling what we expect to see here in the mean of a discrete probability distribution. They are similar. All right, let's find the mean for the personality inventory test for passive-aggressive traits. Remember, mu is equal to the sum of x times the probability of each value of x. So row by row, we're just going to multiply each of the x and probabilities together, then sum all of those values together. For the first class, or row, we take the value of x and multiply it by the probability we already found, 0 0.16, and multiply those together. And we get 0 0.16 because it's just multiplying by 1. Then we do the second class. The x2 multiplied by 0 0.22, the probability, we get 0 0.44. Then we do this all the way down. After this, we sum the products together to get our mean. The mean for this probability distribution is 
That is the average value of passive aggressive traits scored in the test. And if you remember, three actually meant that no traits were shown, either of the passive or aggressive. So the results mean that the average is slightly more towards the passive direction. Now we move on to variance and standard deviation. Again, we can compare these formulas to those for frequency distributions. For the variance, we are going to find the deviations from the mean, square them, and multiply them by the probability. Or as we found a moment ago, the same thing as frequency over n, or sample size. For standard deviation, we are simply going to take the square root of all of that. So let's do this for the passive aggressive test. We're going to find the variance in standard deviation of this probability distribution. I need to remember that we already found the mean, which was about 2.94. So my first step is to find all the deviations. That means subtract x minus the mean. Remember, it's OK to get negative values here because we will be squaring them. So the first one, we subtract 1 minus 2.94 and get negative 1.94. Then the next one, we subtract 2 minus 2.94, and we get negative 0.94, and so on. After that, we need to square all the deviations. When we do the first one, we square negative 1.94 and get 3.7636, and we do this for the rest of them. Lastly, we multiply the squares by the probabilities we previously found. For this first one, we multiply 3.7636 by 0.16 and get 0.60218. Then we do the rest of them. An important note at this point, I wouldn't go any further than this with the decimal places, but I would keep them to this level of accuracy until you get to the end. That way you're preserving accuracy all the way through, and you won't have any mistakes that were made because you rounded too soon. You will round at the end of the problem. Okay, after multiplying all of them through, we sum or add up all of the products and we get about 1.6164. That's the variance. Then we find the square root of that amount and we get about 1.27 or 1.3. Here is where we round. Our result means most of the data points differ from the mean by no more than 1.3. Okay, a quick calculator note here. In case you're not aware of how to do this, if you have an answer on your calculator that you then need to perform an operation on, you can use the second key and answer or negative key to retrieve that answer. Here's how I would have found the square root in this problem. If you want to follow along, type in the number 1.6164, the, the variance value that we just found on your calculator. Now follow the instructions on the bottom of the slide. Press the second key, then the x squared key, which is really selecting the square root above it because of the second key. Then select the second key again, and select the negative key at the bottom right. It's just to the inside of the enter key. It looks like a minus sign with parentheses and has abbreviation for answer above it in whatever color your second key is in. This recalls the answer from your previous operation. You can always add, subtract, multiply, divide, or raise to a power a previous answer simply by pressing those buttons immediately after arriving at the answer. But if you need to press other keys, like the second key and square root, that's when the answer key comes in handy. Practice it for yourself. Pause the video if you'd like to put this in your calculator notes. And you may have to press enter after you've pressed the answer key to get it to calculate. All right, moving on. A lot of times you'll see the mean of a probability distribution called the expected value of a discrete random variable. So you might see this notation of E of X. That means the expected value of the variable X, and it is the same formula as the mean that we went over a few minutes ago. Again, it is the sum of X times the probability of each value. Here's an example. At a raffle, 1,500 tickets are sold at $2 each for four prizes of $500, $250, $150, and $75. You buy one ticket. What is the expected value of your gain? To find the gain for each prize, we first have to subtract the price of the ticket from the prize. This is going to be our x value. 
we're subtracting the price of the ticket because if we win $500 but we paid $2, we actually only won $498. Also, if we don't win a prize at all, our gain is, you guessed it, negative $2. We're covering all of the scenarios here in order to cover the probability of every situation happening, us winning each of the prizes or not winning a prize at all. Okay, so that was for the gain, for the value for each one of the types of situations that we could have. Now to the probability part. The probability of winning each of these prizes, since there's only one prize each, is one out of the total number of tickets each, so one out of 1,500. The last one is where you have to think a little bit. There are four prizes, so four people who bought tickets are not going to lose. And this last column is for the losing probability. So the probability of losing is 1,500 minus the, those four that will win. So 1,496 out of 1,500. Now we do the multiplication. We multiply the x, the potential value of each ticket, including the losing ticket, at negative 2, and multiply by the probability of achieving that outcome. The outcome in the first four columns is winning the prize. The outcome in the last column is losing all four prizes. So we multiply the negative 2 by 1496 over 1500. Okay, understand all of those calculations? Last thing, we add all of these up to get our total sum and we get negative 135. The meaning of this is that we can expect to lose an average of $1.35 for every ticket that we buy. Not a great investment. <laughs> okay, so we've covered quite a bit here. We have distinguished between discrete random variables and continuous random variables. We constructed a discrete probability distribution and its graph and determined if a distribution is a probability distribution. We found the mean variance and standard deviation of a discrete probability distribution. And we found the expected value of a discrete probability distribution. Great job. Just make sure that you're keeping up with notes on the notation and the little bits of calculator notes we covered as well. Make sure you understand the differences between the different formulas and when to use them and how they're different to what we have used in the past. I know it's a lot, but think about how much you've mastered already. You're doing great. Okay, I'll see you in the next video.